grace is no excuse for life of sin. You'll find no quarter for sin on the pages of Scripture. There is no excuse for a life of sin, certainly not the grace of God found in the gospel. Now, these abuses of grace or these abuses of the gospel are being addressed from the standpoint of anticipated objections. Paul is anticipating and then answering these foolish notions of grace. And he's doing so through the use of questions. The first objection answered in verses 1 through 14 was essentially this. If God's grace abounds to us in our sin, if God pours out his grace to us in our sin, then why not simply continue in sin? Right? Why not simply live? Why can't we continue to live a life of sin if God is simply being gracious to us in our sin? Doesn't that glorify God? <laughs> Doesn't that glorify his grace? Doesn't that glorify his work in the gospel? Well, the second objection is like it, slightly different though. And I want you to see that. The second objection is answered beginning in verse 15. And the objection there is essentially this. If believers are no longer under the law, as you've said, Paul, then why not simply continue to live in sin since we're not under the law any longer? You see, from both angles, it's why can't I live in sin? Why can't I have my sin, right? From both angles. But the second objection, slightly differently. Paul has said, Paul, you said we're not under law, we're under grace. Well, if we're no longer under law, then why not simply continue to sin? If law has no bearing on the life of a Christian, if I'm not under law's commanding power, and I'm not, not that's what they would say, I'm not under law's commanding power, then I can simply live as I want to live. What then? Verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? And Paul's answer here is equally emphatic, isn't it? Certainly not. May it never be. God forbid. You'll find no excuse for sin in the scriptures. You've said, Paul, you've said that our justification has nothing to do with our obedience to the law. Our right standing with God is not maintained or sustained by our obedience to the law. You've explained that our standing with God is secure through the person and work of Jesus Christ alone and that where sin abounds, grace superabounds. We're no longer under the condemning power of the law. We're under the superabounding operations of his grace. So then it doesn't matter, Paul, does it? How we live. We can sin as we please. Paul answers, that is absolutely foolish, absolutely absurd, absolutely not. May it never be, God forbid. Can't I now live in a pattern of sin? Aren't we now in this status, in this condition, aren't we now able to live a life that might be characterized by slavery or servitude to sin? Certainly, I don't have to be concerned with sin any longer. If I'm in this position, why am I still concerned with sin? I actually had someone come up to me one time and ask me that and almost parrot this very objection, right? If I've been taken out from under law and I'm now under God's grace, why do I have to ask for forgiveness? Why do I have to pray for forgiveness? Why do I have to fight sin? What are you talking about, right? This is not an imaginary question, is it? This is not a fictional question. This is a real question. This is a real concern. This is not a trifle concern. This is a very important concern. You can see it's the same basic issue that Paul is addressing all along. The ongoing pattern of sin or the ongoing relationship of a Christian to his sin is just presented now from a different perspective. Sin is deceptive. Sin can lead you down a primrose path to hell. We need to understand what Paul is teaching in this text and apply this teaching to our hearts and minds. Just as there were essentially two groups that twisted or perverted the gospel on this issue in Paul's day, there are essentially two groups that pervert or corrupt the gospel on this point in our day. Essentially the same groups, legalists and antinomians. Legalists and antinomians. The legalist, known otherwise as a religious formalist or a moralist, he looks at his Christianity, his so called Christianity, his religion, like a Pharisee. We must maintain moral or ethical standards through the law. We relate to God. He wouldn't say that we relate to God through grace or relate to God through the gospel. We relate to God through the law. God is well pleased with us through our obedience to the law. God will condemn us 
due to our disobedience to the law. We relate to God entirely through the law. Any salvation, they would say, any salvation that does not emphasize some level of obedience to the law as the means by which we attain to right standing with God, any salvation, so-called salvation, that doesn't allow for that is dangerous. Dangerous. It's going to promote lawlessness. Justification by faith alone through Christ alone is dangerous because it's going to promote lawlessness. That legalist would state the question in verse 15 this way. If what you're saying is true, Paul, if what you're saying is true, then why not sin it up, everybody? Right? Do you hear the sarcasm in the way that he asked the question? Why not sin it up? We're no longer under law. We're under grace. The antinomian, the antinomian has the opposite concern. We're not under law. You said it yourself, Paul. Then it doesn't matter how we live. Doesn't matter how I live. We can live as we please. And they turn the grace of God into lawlessness, into licentiousness. Now, as much as the true gospel, the biblical gospel exposes these two errors, Preaching the true gospel will expose you to both of these accusations. If you're preaching an accurate biblical gospel, you're going to be exposed to these two accusations. Think about it with me. The legalist is going to charge you with promoting antinomianism. You're going to get accused by the legalist for preaching antinomianism, lawlessness. The antinomian is going to charge you with legalism. You mentioned the O word, obedience. (laughs) Legalism, right? But if the gospel that you're preaching is a true gospel, is the biblical gospel, then it exposes both of these errors with the searing spotlight of God's word. It exposes both of these errors and it guards us from these two errors. An accurate biblical gospel protects you from the ditch of legalism and the ditch of antinomianism. Paul goes on to say in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, and if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed, let him be damned. If you think about this, it requires, doesn't it then? It requires that we spend some thoughtful time in our evangelism to give a full presentation of the facts. You can't give a quick cartoon version of the gospel devoid of content, and then call for a decision and expect that that is going to be an accurate presentation or an accurate reception of the gospel. It's like so many churches do today. They don't preach the gospel during the sermon. They'll give a couple of seconds at the end for a quick cartoon version of what they call the gospel and ask for a a decision. The message can be simple, but the message must be sufficiently full. The message must be sufficiently complete. Believe in Jesus is not sufficient. Believe in Jesus for what? Believe in Jesus about what? What are you trusting him for, right? What is the content or the substance of your faith? It's not just an ethereal believing, like you believe in Abraham Lincoln, right? Believe in Jesus for what? Jesus loves you, not sufficient, right? Not sufficient. You're going to have to confront the sinner with the law. You're going to have to confront the sinner with his current condition. It has to be done. It has to be done. You're going to have to say hard things. Gird up your loins, right? Play the man. (laughs) You're going to have to say hard things. You're going to have to talk about Christ's substitution at the cross. You're going to have to discuss the biblical response of repentance and faith. Preaching the gospel is not merely having a theological discussion. He and I got in a discussion about whether Adam had a belly button and I I was preaching the gospel. You weren't preaching the gospel to him, right? That's not the gospel. Preaching the gospel is not merely inviting someone to church. Preaching the gospel, in other words, you you can't justify yourself that I've obeyed God in the Great Commission by simply inviting someone to church, right? By simply having a theological discussion. Preaching the gospel is not merely sharing your testimony. There is a content to our faith. Someone must be brought under the law to understand that they're a sinner. They've rebelled against God. They're enemies of God by their wicked works. They need to be brought under the law to know their condition. And then the glorious grace of the gospel must be presented in its fullness to them, right? The person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ and the sinner's response of repentance and faith. You have to understand. Paul appeals to a general principle. Do you not know? In other words, this is common sense, right? This should be common sense. This is something that we should understand, something that we should know. Do you not know 
that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. The general principle is this. You are a slave of what you obey. That's the principle. You are a slave. I'm not a slave. You are a slave of what you obey. Hear the word of God, right? You're a slave of what you obey. Now notice first, the principle presupposes that we're all slaves. We're all slaves. Paul's concern is not slavery to sin versus freedom to live as we please, to live as ourselves. Paul's concern is not slavery to sin versus our personal autonomy to live as the rulers of our own lives. We're all slaves. That's the given in verse 16. We're all slaves. To whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey. Paul's concern is not the fact of our slavery. Paul's concern is the nature of our slavery. The nature of our slavery. Notice next, notice next, the nature of our slavery is discerned by who or what it is that we obey. What is the nature of our slavery? We are either one, slaves of sin leading to death, or two, we are slaves of obedience leading to righteousness. Now, you know the axiom, do you not know? It's common sense. This is something, this is a little experiment. This is a little uh, self-examination that you can take yourself through right now, right? Something that we should know, something that's axiomatic. Who are you obeying? Are you obeying sin leading to death or are you a slave of obedience leading to righteousness? You are one or the other. You are a slave. You are a slave. Who are you obeying? What is the nature of your slavery? In other words, a habitual pattern of sinning demonstrates or manifests a condition of slavery to sin. Hear what I'm saying. A habitual pattern of sinning demonstrates a condition of slavery to sin. A habitual pattern of obedience demonstrates or manifests a condition of slavery to obedience. As James says, when sinful desire has conceived, that desire gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. It is sin leading to death. If you demonstrate by your actions a habitual pattern of sin, you are manifesting through your actions that you are a slave of sin leading to death. Leading to death. Not just spiritual death. You're already spiritual dead in sin, spiritually dead in sin. Not just physical death, but what the Bible calls eternal death or the second death. So also then, so also slavery to God, verse 22 Slavery to God manifests itself in a pattern of obedience, bringing forth its fruit to holiness and the end of that pattern, everlasting life. Do you see? Everlasting life. 